Mr. Hill. Glacier Waterton National Park is a huge economic driver in this area. Montana and British Columbia governments have agreed to withdraw public lands surrounding the parks from future mining and drilling. Meanwhile, fracking pads on private land are sprouting up just east of Glacier. How do you promote more natural resource development in the area while abating the concerns of those who say it could permanently change the landscape surrounding the park? Well, the, uh, I think everybody in the room understands how the fracking process works. Uh, wells are drilled to a mile or two miles deep, and then there's horizontal drilling that goes out. Um, the, uh, the shale is fractured, and then the oil is returned. Um, there is no threat of surface damage. There's no threat, I think, of water uh, in, in, impacting the water of the area. So there really isn't any serious uh, environmental impacts that come from that process as long as it's far enough away. I mean, obviously, if there's private lands involved, people have a right to develop their private lands, and they have the right to develop the natural resources in those private lands, and I support that notion. The park is something that's pretty precious to me, as I think everybody in this room knows. When I served in the Congress, the Park Service was developing a new management plan, and part of that management plan was a decision with regard to what we should do with the going to the Sun Highway. And there was a lot of controversy with that. I brought the Resources Committee, the Parks Committee to Montana. We had hearings here. We listened to the concerns of the citizens. And as a part of that process, we were able to put together a Citizens Committee that advised the Park Service on how to reconstruct that road so that we could maintain the economic benefits of that and still preserve what's special about the park. So that's how I think that we need to approach that. Thank you for the question. Mr. Bullock, two minutes. Thanks so much for the question. You know the. The land board that I currently sit on has been the most productive land board in our state's history, bringing in the most revenue, almost twice as much as what was brought under Governor Martz at her time. And I think that the mantra that I and others have had is we responsibly develop our resources. When we talk about this area as one example, um, the land board voted actually to make sure that there was no surface occupancy on areas around the North Fork because there are some places that we need to make sure that we protect. And especially also think about what one of the big economic drivers is in this area. And that's tourism. It's the opportunity to see these beautiful areas, to come. People come from all around the world to do so. So we need to preserve that and always protect that and make sure that we keep that in mind when we responsibly develop. Another area would be um, timber management. You know, this land board's actually sold about 215 million board feet of timber. And on the state side, we do it, we do it well, and we keep our working forests healthy. That was 2,153 jobs for the state, about half of them just in this valley, in this area alone. So we can do both. One thing we don't want to do is go back about 60 years and not be thinking about what this place is going to be like for future generations. We, we can draw on, though, the clean water, the healthy areas, responsibly develop, but also preserve those areas that need to be preserved, not only for today, but for future generations. Mr. Hill, one minute rebuttal. Surprisingly, I, I suspect this may be one of the few occasions tonight where, John, where uh, Steve and I will agree largely on the answer. There certainly are places that are sp uh, precious and special, um, but certainly we want to develop energy in Montana. It's a tremendous opportunity for us to improve our economy, to help the nation become energy independent, to help us deal with the structural deficit, the structural trade deficit that we have in this country. So energy development is very, very important as well. So the fact that we can find balance between developing the resource and preserving what's special about Montana is something I think we can all agree on. Thank you. Um, this question is for Mr. Bullock. It's no secret that the recession and falling wood prices have hurt the timber industry in northwest Montana. But in recent years, lawsuits have also held up harvesting projects on public lands that were supported by the U.S. Forest Service and could give the industry a lift. Do you support, support ways to expedite or limit, it, or limit litigation on approved timber and other natural resource projects? Or do you think the process works fine as it is? Well, I think that is an area. Taking back to my earlier question, on state lands, we've been able to do it well. And we've been able to do it in a way that we responsibly manage, money comes in for the school trust, but we're also not wrapped up in litigation forever. And we know that timber and timber harvesting is a critical part 
and critical to this valley as well as so many other state areas around the state. That's why it's nice when also there was a wood, even a wood products revolving loan fund to make sure that we keep the mills open because we can't lose any more mills. You know, I've talked to actually the regional forester, so it's a new one. She's out of Missoula and she manages the federal, uh, the federal lands. And it said, how frustrating it is at times when good ideas and even collaborative ideas where people are coming together end up tied up in litigation. So I think one of the things that we can do is at the state, I mean, we've had over 100 or about 100 timber sales in the last four years, is we can take the lead. And that's what I said to her, is that let's find those collaborative state federal partnerships where actually the state can take the lead in managing those lands and working together. And that's going to make it much less likely that these sort of lawsuits are occurring. The, uh, it is true that the state of Montana manages its lands a superior way than the federal lands do. Uh, we're able to harvest on them. The lands are in better condition. They provide better wildlife habitat. Uh, of course, the challenge is, is that the federal lands are the issue here. And the, the fact that over the last two decades, there's been less and less access to those federal lands. In fact, Steve is supported largely by the environmental groups that are part of the effort to keep us out of those public lands. So one of the things John Sanju and I have decided to do is that we're going to, uh, within the governor's office, we're going to become an advocate for the state of Montana. We're going to be an advocate in pushing against the federal government and against those environmental groups who are challenging access to those lands. Uh, one of the things we want to do is to assist local governments, county governments, as they assert their coordination rights with the federal land managers so that the local governments are having a voice at the table in deciding what the resource development ought to be in their county. And that's something the state has never done. The legislature two sessions ago passed a bill that said that the state of Montana has a right to weigh in on federal land management decisions. But the current administration has said that they don't want to do that, they don't have the resources, and they don't think it's important enough. I do think it's important. And I think it's really important that we insist that our federal neighbors become responsible land managers. They manage this resource in a way that helps our economy, improves the value of the resource, increases the opportunities for, for, for wildlife on that resource to improve hunting and other recreational opportunities. And so that'll be a dramatic difference between the Hill administration and I think the Bullock administration and the current administration. Mr. Bullock, one minute. Yeah, the Congressman also says Steve's supported largely by these environmental groups. I'm supported by Montanans across the board, large and small. I gotta tell you, I haven't received any $500,000 checks lately. <laughs> no, don't, we're not clapping. And it really is that my campaign's about Montana. My campaign is about where we can go in Montana and do great things. And in addition, as we're talking about it, you know, I've visited also in the Valley Plum Creek Timber. The more value-added things that we can do as well. But I get contributions large and small. And I don't think that anybody could say, even see my wife's aunt out there. So I think she even helped me out. I don't think anybody could turn around and say that it's just one group that's supporting me it's all Montanans from all walks of life, and indeed Democrats and some Republicans as well. Thank you. Uh, um, Mr. Hill, your next question will come from Myers Reese. Uh, Mr. Hill, as an attorney general, your opponent has worked to uphold Montana's campaign finance restrictions as courts chip away at the state's laws in the wake of Citizens United. In this most recent court exchange, a judge, a judge struck down Montana's campaign contribution limits, and six days later, an appeals court reinstated them. A report just surfaced today that I believe your opponent just uh, uh, mentioned. Um, the report surfaced today that in those six days in which the limits weren't in place, the Montana Republican Party donated $500,000 to your campaign. Uh, Mr. Bullock's campaign says the donation is illegal. First off, what's your response to his claim? And secondly, do you believe Montana should fight to uphold its campaign finance laws? Uh, first of all, the campaign contribution is entirely legal. Uh, it occurred during a period of time in which a federal district court judge had declared Montana's contribution limits unconstitutional. And uh, 
and uh, restricted the campaign practices office from enforcing the law. It was on the basis of that reliance that we accepted a contribution from the Montana Republican Party. Now, it probably should come as no surprise to the people in this room that the Montana Republican Party is supporting us in this election. Uh, of course they are. Um, and these are funds that presumably, at least, the Montana Republican Party would have spent independently to try to aid our campaign in some way, I presume, had they not contributed to, to our race. But um, there is n nothing to suggest that during that period of time there was anything illegal about this, these campaign contributions and they were entirely uh, illegal. And we will assert that in every venue that we're required to do so. I think it's important to understand is that what the, the federal judge was concerned about, and I think everybody in this room is witness to what's been happening with these independent groups that, that run these vile ads attacking people, they're able to collect money in unlimited amounts from labor unions and corporations and George Soros and all kinds of wealthy people attacking candidates. And what essentially the judge was saying is, is that that's an unfair playing field. How is it that candidates can be out here limited to raising money at $600 per person and the groups that are attacking him can raise money from people at $100,000 per person? And we've been victimized by those kinds of attacks, and you've seen it both in the Senate race and our race and other races. And that's what the judge was saying is not fair, and I, and I don't think it's fair. The system is clearly broken. We have a plan for how we can fix it, and I'll try to address that when I get my rebuttal opportunity. Mr. Bullock, two minutes. You know, I recognize today that I'm running against someone that will do anything and say anything to get elected. And I don't think that's what Montana is all about. I honestly think that we expect more. And that's one of the reasons why we have had a great system. What the law says is aggregate contributions are limited for each election as follows. Now, and I will agree with the congressman that for five days, the district court judge said, all right, I put a stay meaning you can't actually enforce the laws. Commissioner of Political Practice, you can't enforce the laws. But the Ninth Circuit said, wait a minute. We've been to this rodeo. We were just at this rodeo 10 years ago when the Ninth Circuit upheld our contribution limits. So now that law's back in force. And that law doesn't say, okay, you can just have a little window where you can pile in as much money as you want. It says aggregate contributions are limited per election as follows. And there's limits. And just like, and it's happened with the congressman before, it's happened with my campaign, when somebody gives over the limit, you have to write them a check back. If that happens today, you have to write them a check back. So when the congressman accepted the $500,000, it might have been legal to actually accept that check. But the illegality is keeping the check when right now Montana law says you can only take in total this much from each group. And he has that. He announced it actually today, even before the filing time, hoping, I guess, that might end up part of the conversation. It's flat out illegal. It's also we expect elections actually to have contribution limits, and we expect us actually to follow them. Mr. Hill, one minute. So this all comes from a candidate who had in 2008, ran out of money, so he put his employees on the Democratic payroll. This all comes from a candidate that has five investigations going on for campaign violations. This comes from a guy who uh, put up a straw candidate, the wife of a political consultant, uh, as a potential candidate so he could double the contribution limits that he could collect in the primary election. This is the guy who invited the Democratic uh, Governor's Association to run attack ads against us while he was pretending that he was opposed to that kind of expenditure. And so now he's trying to come here and say to you, we've somehow disadvantaged his campaign. Um, frankly, Steve, that dog don't hunt. Next question is for uh, Mr. Bullock from Myers-Reese. Mr. Bullock, your opponent, <coughs> excuse me, your opponent has accused you of lacking leadership as Attorney General during Montana's medical marijuana boom. 
As medical marijuana remains a, a widely discussed, discussed issue in the state today, what is your response to your opponent's claims uh, about your lack of leadership, and what are your plans to address medical marijuana if you're elected? Yeah, I guess, as I said before, here's a candidate that will do and say anything to get elected. First Congressman, five complaints were filed against me. Most of them have already been dismissed because they're silly. The way that staffing has worked has actually been for decades. I don't even know what the, th oh, invited someone to make independent expenditures. If I was actually coordinating with them, that would be illegal. Sort of like illegal taking $500,000. To the point of medical marijuana, and you could talk to law enforcement in this area even, that as the state's chief lawyer and chief law enforcement officer, long before last session, we were working together. We brought law enforcement together and said, you know what? This was passed by Citizens Initiative. And everybody had somebody in mind at that time. And we want to make sure that they can get that somebody in mind. But when all of a sudden you have 30,000 cardholders, when the largest group is chronic pain, age 19 to 29, I mean, I've got a sore back now and then, but there were significant abuses. We gave over 100 presentations up here as well, all across the state, saying, here are some of the problems with current law. Here are ways that we can fix it. We brought all law enforcement together gave a four-page memo to the legislature and said, here are some of our most significant concerns. Most of the last decade, I think the congressman was in his house in California. He wasn't at any of those hearings and discussions and things like that. We were working on solving the issue. And we still have to do more to solve the issue. Next legislative session, because it's not fixed and it's still wrapped up, I mean, there are pleadings filed today on the issue. We still have to make sure that we have a system where we can closely and tightly regulate it. Those that are entitled to it under the law, we want to get it, but we also won't, don't want abuses. And we can make that system. Other states have gotten a lot closer. We've gotten closer in some respects, and we'll get further next session. Mr. Hill, two minutes. My criticism of Steve uh, comes from multiple sources. Uh, I think at our debate, it was in, um, I think it was in, uh, probably Butte, when this issue came up and, and I challenged him about it, and he said, well, we responded to the problem. We had, my staff had 75 meetings and I wrote a four-page memo. I mean, I guess we can solve medical marijuana writing a four-page memo, then maybe we can solve the pension problem with a six-page memo. Maybe we get jobs back in Montana with just a 10-page memo, Steve. But the truth is, is that at these public meetings, one that you attended, Representative Hansen, who was a deputy county attorney in Hill County asked you, what are we going to do about medical marijuana? And what you said to her at that meeting was, I don't have the political capital to do it. That's what you said. And you're right, you don't. And at, during, the process of the, during the process of the legislative session, uh, uh, Representative McGilvery and, and Representative Howard went to you and said, would you help us with this problem? Would you do something to help us with this problem? And you told them then that you didn't have the political capital to do that. Now, you know, the other night at the debate, that, uh, in the vice president debate, Paul Ryan made a point, I think, with uh, Vice President Biden. And he said, leaders run to problems. They don't run away from problems. And, my, and that's my criticism here, Steve, is that this was the largest law enforcement problem in the state of Montana. And you ran from the problem rather than ran to it. Again, Congressman, I'm not sure where you were. You might have been in California. But you can talk to law enforcement about how we came together and we said, here are the principal issues facing law enforcement in Montana on this issue. And how we met every week during the legislative session as a result. And when you reference these Republican legislators, again, this is a man who will do and say anything to get elected. I did have a meeting with Representative Howard and Representative McGilvery. You know, I had a lot of meetings with Republicans and actually got quite a bit done last session. They said, we want you to actually get the Democrats together and repeal. Law enforcement wasn't even saying at the time, let's repeal. I said, I'll talk to them. Yeah, you know, I did talk to folks. And I don't think that's in the best interest of Montana. It's also not in the best interest of the citizens that passed it. So if you're going to try to relay meetings that you weren't at, and you might have even been in California at the time, I mean, at least get it right, please. 
Thank you. Um, Mr. Hill, this next, in, next question is for you. There are tens of thousands of Montanans without health insurance. In overturning part of the Affordable Care Act, the Supreme Court has ruled that the government can't force states to expand its Medicaid program. You have said you see big problems with expanding Medicaid, but what's a better option to get more Montanans covered by health insurance? A really good question. Uh, I think uh, Governor Schweitzer, when uh, the uh, Affordability Act, which we commonly call Obamacare, passed, said that the Medicaid expansion provisions of that bill, if forced upon us, um, would bankrupt the state. And certainly it would result in hundreds of millions of dollars of expenditures each biennium once it's fully implemented. Um, in addition to that, it, uh, Medicaid has a cost shift to private health insurance that's substantial. Let me explain that. Uh, because Medicaid compensates providers less than the market rates or the cost of providing those services, the providers of those services shift those costs to private carriers. And so if you have private insurance, you pay $2,500 to $3,000 more for your health insurance today because of the cost shift that comes from Medicaid and from Medicare. And so if we expand the population and it undercompensates uh, providers, that'll even add more to the cost of private health insurance. So there, there is a better alternative, I think. Republicans in the Congress who are talking about repealing uh, the Affordability Act are talking about a premium support system for low-income people to be able to go out and buy insurance if they want or buy, uh, uh, work with the community health service or to uh, buy insurance through a co-op or one of the various alternatives that would be out there. If, the affordability, if Obama's re-elected president and the Affordability Act stays in place, which would probably happen if he is, then one of the alternatives is for those people to buy their insurance on the exchange rather than to go through Medicaid expansion. I have not been able to detect any significant support among legislators for Medicaid expansion because of the risk to Montana's budget, the added costs that will provide for the people who buy private health insurance, and so I don't support the Medicaid expansion at this time. Mr. Bullock, two minutes. There are challenges and there may be opportunities as well. I think all of us can agree that, you know, we pay too much, we get too little in health care. And a lot of folks are one major illness away from a bankruptcy. And the congressman is correct that a lot of these costs are shifted, be it either by individuals using the emergency room for their health care or actually an increase in our insurance rates as well. We can work on a Montana-made solution. You know, even in this valley, I've met with the hospital at, up here in Kalispell, also in Whitefish. And they're saying, all right, let's figure out a way to start actually paying for results, not repeated tests. And let's figure out a way that we're actually working to make people more healthy. And there are possibilities to do that. Now, the Supreme Court came down and made its decision. Feds haven't even written the rules on what possibilities there are for states to do so. Other states, be it Oregon, be it uh, uh, North Carolina, not with a Medicaid expansion, but it said, let's let us design a program and let's use Medicaid as part of it. But we can go a lot further. And there's some good things that are happening there. So I think what we need to do is figure out what all the ground rules are before we say there's no way that we're going to even look at it. An election, a decision doesn't have to be made until 2014. Between then and now, I think we can figure out a heck of a lot and decide if it's possible to make a Montana-made solution that works for us, that's fiscally responsible, and that'll actually make sure that more people are healthy in Montana, which is the ultimate goal of this whole healthcare system. One minute. One of the things you said earlier, I've challenged Steve on the issues of leadership, and this is another example where I criticize him on leadership, and that is he didn't join the other attorney generals in challenging Obamacare. Now, a lot of people believe that that challenge only was associated with the individual mandate, which, of course, the Supreme Court struck down as uh, the, the authority of Congress under the Commerce Clause, which is what they were arguing all those times, and said, well, it's okay as a tax. But in my view, just as important was the challenge with regard to the mandatory, the mandatory Medicaid expansion that was part of the Obama care. And you may recall that the Supreme Court struck that down, said it was coercive said that it breaks down the principles of federalism. Part of uh, the responsibility of the next governor is somebody to stand up for the state of Montana. And sometimes it means standing up against the federal government. Steve didn't do that in this instance, and it makes me wonder whether he would do that as governor. I will. 
Thank you. Mr. Bullock, this next question is for you. You have proposed using part of the state surplus to provide homeowners a one-time $400 property tax rebate if elected governor, while your opponent has proposed permanent tax relief to made up, be made up partly by oil and gas revenue. But do you think it's appropriate to be discussing tax cuts when the projected shortfall for the state's government worker pension system exceeds $3 billion over 30 years? How do you propose to make up for this shortfall, and what changes need to be made to the retirement system to make sure it doesn't happen again? Thanks for the question. First, real briefly on the challenge to the Affordable Care Act. The Supreme Court isn't like American Idol. You get one more state on and they finally say we're there. We're in a good fiscal position. And we got there not by joining lawsuits where our participation wouldn't have made a bit of difference. And we would have had to pay for that. And here's a guy who's been an insurance executive. I mean, for the last decade, he made hundreds of thousands of dollars by serving on Blue Cross and getting all kinds of payments from some of the subsidiaries. He had the chance in the last decade to then try to control insurance costs if that's what the issue is. And not a thing happened. Our rates went up time and time again and he got our premium dollars. The, the, the direct question now of what do we do with the pension system? Yeah. I mean, the first thing that we do is we don't panic. It is underfunded. But just sort of like if you looked at your mortgage today and said, oh my gosh, I owe X hundred thousands of dollars, it could make you a little nervous. But we chip at this over time. And that's how we can do this and this, that's how we can solve the problem. The employer ought to pay a little bit more. The employee ought to pay a little bit more. We can chip in a little bit from the state and we can preserve the system. If we eliminated it today and said, all right, we're all going just to straight 401ks, that bar tab, the amount that we owe, all of a sudden gets a heck of a lot bigger. So let's actually do it responsibly, recognizing that we need to get to work on it, and we can do it in a bipartisan way, and we do that over time, that system's preserved. And I think that's better for our public employees, our teachers, our firefighters, everyone across the state, as well as the overall viability of the state as well. Two minutes. So Steve didn't think that joining the lawsuit over Obamacare was important enough or it would have mattered. But what's interesting is he joined a lawsuit recently that asserts that universities should be able to use racial preferences in admissions. Joined, I think, five or six other attorney generals. Uh, just recently, the EPA uh, put out new rules on utilities that shut down the correct plant in Billings uh, 23, I think, attorney generals, six Democrats, 17 of them Republicans, joined in a lawsuit to try to stop those rules. Montana's the only coal, coal producing state in the country that didn't join that lawsuit. Now, I think that join a lawsuit that preserves 40 jobs and the power to 100,000 homes in Montana is a lot more important than whether or not this university or some other university ought to be allowed to use racial profiling in their admissions uh, process. And so I disagree. On the big issues, Steve, you haven't been there. And that's the assertion that I've been trying to make. Now, with regard to the surplus, I am proposing that we take the oil and gas revenues that accrue to the state of Montana, about $230 million in 2011, about $105 million of that goes to the local governments, at least $125 million a year, $250 million a biennium, that we use that to fund education and have that offset property taxes so that every small business in Montana, every homeowner in Montana will get property tax relief. And this will be permanent property tax relief. It'll be next year and the following year and the year after that and the year after that. Steve's plan, which is a one-time $400 rebate, even the members of his own political party say it's lousy politics and it's lousy policy, and it is. We want to provide permanent tax relief to Montanans so we can grow our economy, so we can put more money in the pockets of families, so that they can do more things for their families, and that's what our plan is. Mr. Bullock, one minute. Sure, brief, briefly uh, picking up on where he was, and there is a difference between joining a lawsuit and a friend of the court brief. I did join a friend of the court brief saying, you know what, universities can actually use racial preferences. In Montana, 10% of the kids coming out of our high school are American Indian. The Board of Regents for years has had, let's provide those opportunities and figure out a way to have a diverse student body. And that was actually just 
a friend of the court brief, it's not spending your money on lawsuits which wouldn't make a bit of difference. Now he poo-poos the $400 that each of you would get that actually John Sanju, his running mate, was the one that carried. His tax relief plan, if you're the average Montanan, you're gonna get 100 bucks. If you have a $10 million house on Flathead, you're gonna get 11,000. If you're a big out-of-state corporation, you're gonna get a lot more. I don't think we wanna overturn what we have with our surplus and things by things like that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hill, your next question will come from Myers Reese. Mr. Hill, you invited Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker to a campaign event in Kalispell recently. Walker is known for taking on public sector unions as part of his effort to tackle Wisconsin's budget crunch. Would you support a similar proposal in Montana to Walker's law in Wisconsin, which repealed most collective bargaining rights for public employees? And for private sector unions, would you support right to work legislation? Good question. My, my view about unions is really pretty simple. If, if you want to be a member of a union, you ought to be able to join a union, whether you work in the public sector or you work in the private sector. And if you don't want to join a union, you shouldn't be compelled to join a union. And so I support right to work. And the reason I support right to work is, from my view, it's a, it's a personal right. It's a right of assembly. You have the right to associate with the union or you have a right not to associate with the union. Um, it, I don't have anything against unions. Uh, it's just that I believe that this is a personal right that people ought to have. But what is important to understand is how much better right-to-work states do than Montana. I mean, if you look at the right-to-work states in the Western United States, all but one of them have substantially higher per capita income than we do. People have larger take-home pay. And one of the reasons for that is, is that about half of the major businesses in this country won't locate a business in a state that's not right to work. And so we preclude ourselves from the opportunities that accrue to us if we were a right to work state. We're surrounded by right to work states. North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, and Idaho are all right to work states. They're all producing jobs at a faster pace than we do. All but one of them have higher incomes than we do. There was a time when we used to tell North Dakota jokes. Remember that? You know, today, the average person in North Dakota makes about $50 a week more than the average person in Montana does because of the dynamic of their economy. Their unemployment rate is under 3%. Ours is over six, nearly six and a half. Uh, uh, South Dakota went through the whole recession with a 4.4% 4, 4 .4 maximum unemployment rate. Uh, we got over 7% the peak of this uh, decline. So I support right to work because I know that it'll produce more jobs and better paying jobs for the people of Montana. Mr. Bullock, two minutes. Yeah, and Governor Walker was up here last week, and uh, the congressman said, boy, I admire that guy. I admire that guy in a state where Forbes says, you know, Montana is actually 23rd best in the nation for businesses. Wisconsin is 40. Last week, the Tax Foundation came out and said, we have the eighth best overall tax climate for small, medium-sized, all businesses. Wisconsin is 43. Teachers after... Governor Walker did that, have lost four to $5,000 a year in take-home pay. That's not the kind of admiration, not the kind of Montana that I think that we need. We have, uh, you know, the right to organize and collectively bargain provides benefits for employers and employees. No one has to join a union, they just have to pay their fair share under it. And I've also seen I've seen, you know, I've met apprentices, young electricians, young carpenters that are being trained, trained and are going to have great jobs. The Carpenters Union is actually the sixth largest publisher of instructional manuals for carpentry. So actually creating skills and creating opportunities. I don't think that the answer to all of the problems or even the problems that the congressman wants to create is to become Wisconsin. We're better people than that. And we can be a lot better people. Don't, uh, let, let's not clap and not boo and things like that. We can be a lot better people than that. And as governor, I'll make sure that we are better people than that. One minute. Uh, governor Walker inherited a $3.8 billion budget deficit. Um, he inherited that from a Democratic governor. And so he had a pretty tough proposition. In uh, Wisconsin, 
the uh, schools required by agreement and by law to buy their health insurance from a health insurance company that was owned by the union. And once they put that out for bid, they were able to save thousands and thousands of dollars on their health insurance. And so part of what he said is that we're not going to bargain on that anymore. And so, uh, you know, if you take the, the 10 top performing states in the country in terms of employment growth and, uh, and replacement of jobs, nine of those are Republican governors. And one of them is Scott Walker. And I admired the work that he did in tackling a really tough budget situation and solving it. What's really interesting is the teachers there, for the most part, are happy. Those that were given an opportunity to not stay in the union chose not to stay in the union. And that's what I think we have to have as an option in Montana as well. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bullock, next question to you from Myers-Reese. Mr. Bullock, throughout the campaign, your, your opponent has described Montana as having a hostile business climate. Uh, pointing to the state's low ranks and per capita income, job creation, wages. Uh, here in northwest Montana, counties have consistently posted the state's highest unemployment rates. Uh, you've sought to paint a more optimistic picture of the economy. Uh, do you believe, uh, given the statistics he points out, that Montana's economy has been on the right track in recent years? And if so, why? I think there were national challenges. I mean, we've been facing the most difficult times since, frankly, the Great Recession, and that's throughout the country. This area was certainly hit, and it was hit by housing prices and others, and as Attorney General, I've been working. We actually have foreclosure counselors working and actually trying to get people so they can stay in their home. But I think that there is a real distinction here because even groups that he cites would say, all right, you know, we're actually eighth best right now growing as far as per capita income, seventh best long-term income. Times I'm not running against uh, former congressman. I think I'm running against Chicken Little. He's saying the sky is absolutely falling. In Montana, consistently, we've had unemployment rates lower than the national average. We were one of only a couple of states in the whole nation not to go in the black. We've had more, again, more production on land board than any time in history. So there are good things going. Are there challenges? You bet there's challenges. And we need to address jobs. And we can do more, actually. And we can work on, you know, 97% of the businesses in Montana have 50 or fewer employees. So let's build those Main Street businesses. That's why in our jobs plan we talk about a Main Street Montana task force. That's why we talk about a business equipment tax for 11,000 Montana businesses and try to make sure that the revenues and the opportunities are actually staying here. It has been challenging times. It's been challenging times across the country. But there are good things happening in Montana too. I'm not going to say the sky is falling, everything's falling apart, and cherry pick different statistics. I'm running for governor to be the chief promoter of Montana, not the chief detractor. And there are across the board, even when we look at, so where were we under the last Republican administrations for governor? There's good things happening now. Mr. Hill, two minutes. Last Republican governor uh, was Judy March. We produced about 26,000 new jobs in four years. Under Governor Roscoe, the governor that proceeded, we produced 70,000 jobs in uh, eight years. The governor preceded that, a Republican governor, Stan Stevens, we produced about 30,000 jobs in four years. Under this governor, we've produced uh, less than 20,000 jobs in eight years. I think we can do better than that, and I think Republican governors that proceeded did do better than that. Here's the fact, there are a lot of great things about Montana, but if you wanna make Montana a more prosperous place, if you wanna create more opportunity, you have to say, well, what are the things that are holding us back? And that's what I've been trying to focus on. What are the things that are putting a restraint on our ability to grow this economy? And there are two numbers that just stick out like a sore thumb. One is, is that the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce rates our legal climate 45th in the nation. That is a hostility to business, and it translates into the fact that we have the most expensive business liability system in the United States. If you drive a car, you're paying the fourth most for your car insurance in the country. Is there a reason for that? Yes, there is. It's because we have a legal system that is hostile to business. Our regulatory climate is similar. Forbes magazine says we're 47th, but a lot of groups, almost every business group that evaluates Montana's climate 
were in the bottom third. The American Legislative Exchange Council just examined all the states. And they said, and here's an interesting statistic, our four neighboring states are all in the top six. Montana is 36th in terms of opportunity. So what we need to do is challenge ourselves to say, let's build on what's good and what's right. And there's a lot of that. But we also have to turn to the things that are challenging and say, let's fix them. And that's what leaders do. When you're in business, you say, if we want to be better than we were last year, let's tackle the things that we didn't do as well as we could. And that's what I'm saying that Montana needs to do. Mr. Bullock, one minute. Yeah, I, I think given the fact that we have nationally even been in the worst recession since the Great Depression, some good things have actually happened and will continue to happen. Now, the congressman puts out the U.S. Chamber of Commerce like, well, th this is almost like reading from manna from heaven. I mean, these are the guys that also put extra fingers on John Tester. And when we actually talk about the regulatory climate, should we make sure that it's as efficient and effective as possible? You bet we should. And the congressman worked for the previous two governors, Governor Martz and Governor Roscoe. I'm not sure what all regulations he got rid of other than deregulating our power supply. I know how that worked out for most of Montana. And it's also, if there are obstacles, we should sure address them. And I think that we do address them. But let's again, not just say the sky is falling. Let's say we can always do better and we will do better. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hill. The next question is for you. Your opponent has repeatedly, repeatedly stated that he supports a tuition freeze for the state's university system. You have advocated for a priority-based budgeting approach, which you say will keep costs in check while also keeping tuition from rising. Could you provide details on how you would be able to achieve that? And will programs have to be cut? If so, which ones? Uh, first of all, I want to address the assertion that I work for the last two governors. And let me bring some clarity to that. I, I never worked for the Martz administration. Uh, during her transition period, she asked me if I would help uh, facilitate an economic development conference, as I did. Uh, but I, I never held a position in her administration. And I did work for Governor Roscoe in 1993. Uh, and uh, as far as the deregulation bill that he keeps trying to wrap around my neck, I came out in opposition to the deregulation bill as a Republican. In addition to that, when I worked in Congress, I was able to assert Montana's interests and rights and actually bring the deregulation proposal in Washington to an end. So let's make some clarity of that, and Steve, you should get your facts right. So now, with respect to the question that you just asked with a tuition freeze, I, I also believe that we should have a tuition freeze, but we ought to be managing the university system in a way that puts keeping tuition low as the first priority in budgeting of the university system, not an afterthought in the budgeting of the university system, which is what I believe happens today. You know, I worked in Congress trying to get more and more money for Pell Grants to help students, low-income students, be able to afford tuition. But tuition costs were going up faster than we were able to add to the Pell Grant program or to the loan program. And university costs have been going up faster here and everywhere in the country I'm not picking on our university system, than almost anything except health care. And I think it's time for us to say, no, let's start budgeting the universities. Let's ask the universities to apply a budgeting system that starts with the priority being keeping tuition low. I'll work with the university system to help them identify potentially what programs may be affected by starting with a zero tuition or a very low tuition increase. And then we can take that to the legislature and make a choice. But the way it works now is they say, well, you know, we'll just raise tuition if you don't give us more money. I'd rather look at what the other alternatives and the other choices are before I start asking for more money from the legislature. Mr. Bullock, two minutes. In 1988, when Stan Stevens was running for governor, he actually even had TV spots. He said, you know what, I'm going to do this zero-based budgeting. We'll start everybody at zero. And then we'll go from there. Much like priority budgeting or whatever the congressman is saying is throughout that. You know what? After he campaigned on that, he never even tried to implement it. Governing Magazine this past week looked at Alabama. Alabama came out 2004 and said, you know what? We're going to try this priority-based budgeting. Jettisoned it. And what's happened in the last two years as the congressman's been run for governor? Is he's been saying priority-based budgeting, but he hasn't actually said what his priorities are in investing and investing in our state. And I think that's a real distinction. 
I came out and said, you know what, when the last legislature didn't adequately fund higher education, there's a tuition increase, that's a tax on every working family. And we need to make sure that we keep tuition frozen. I will keep it frozen. But let's actually look at where we need to be and let's actually not just throw out, I mean, not a one, as he said, this is my priorities for investing. What he said is that we'll cut essentially all the taxes that have already blown through the surplus we have and more. Let's not think that we're overly generous to higher education. I mean, our educators, the professors, are paid bottom of the nation. We went from a one time 70% of the educational budget was paid for by the state, 30% was actually paid for through tuition and others. That's now flipped. I'll challenge every expense and I'll make sure we're spending the money correctly. But I'll also make sure that we're not doing it on the backs of Montana's next generation. Mr. Hill, one minute. Priority budgeting, simple idea. Um, you start with what are the values that we're trying to achieve in this program or this activity of government? And then what, uh, how does this program achieve those? And then how do we measure what we're trying to achieve? And then how do we hold people accountable to achieving those objectives? Pretty simple, right? It's outcome-based budgeting. It's something that every business does every day. Most households do that. You establish the priorities based upon the availability of funds, but what's important? But here's the difference, is that under priority budgeting, it isn't a governor that's deciding what the priorities of the state is, it's the stakeholders. And the people that are making that decision is the executive branch and the agency directors working in collaboration with the legislature. So you don't have a war every two years that you come to town for budgeting. It's part of a process of building a community decision about what's important and what's not important, and then building a funding mechanism around it and a management system. It's more about management than budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Mr. Bullock. Mr. Bullock, in previous debates, uh, your opponent has discussed the poor relationship between the governor's office and Republicans who, who control the state legislature. Governor Schweitzer, following the last session, vetoed nearly 80 bills, some with a branding iron that Republicans say mock the legislative process. How would your approach to working with the legislature differ from the current administration? And are there any bills the governor vetoed last session that you would have supported? When he had to veto 79, it's hard to know all of them, but um, how would my approach uh, differ? My approach as governor would be much like my approach as attorney general. And what I tried to do as Attorney General, and I think even John, Senator Sanju would agree at least, I think we were just naming a highway, but by and large I said, let's talk about where we need Montana to be. And we got substantial reform done with DUI. It was carried by Representative Lavin, a Republican up here. We got substantial, and you know, previous legislatures hadn't been able to do it. We also had substantial um, reform done on prescription drug abuse, something that's impacting all of our communities. It had failed the two prior legislators, legislatures. And truly, I did go to leadership and say, you know, these aren't my ideas, these aren't anybody's ideas. Let's talk about where we need Montana to be. And we got there. All those bills passed and I think make a meaningful difference. Representative Kearns, I don't, know if any of you were in the House Judiciary Committee, but when he stood up and said, hell must have frozen over, I'm supporting something that Attorney General does. I said, Representative, we haven't met, it's cold out today, but I'll bet we can find some things in common. And we can. And I think that's how we do it. And I think I did it with respect to the legislature and respect to both parties. That's how I would govern as governor. Of the 79 vetoes, um, I would quibble with some of them. Sure, there was a mandatory vetoes that I would have made on some of the land use planning ones. There, but there are also things that basically were at the core of what Montana is that the governor did have to veto. I will show respect to the legislative branch, but I'll also be forceful and veto bills when they're in the, not in the best interest of Montana. Mr. Hill, two minutes. There are a number of bills that uh, I would have signed that the governor vetoed, obviously. Uh, one of them was a bill that would have given parents control over whether or not they wanted their children to have sex education in kindergarten. 
I don't believe that I want my granddaughter to be forced to have forced to have a sex education course, graphic sex education course in kindergarten. And so I would have signed that bill. I would have signed a bill that uh, said that before an agency can pass new rules that would expect, uh, impact small business, they have to do some analysis of how that cost would affect small businesses. I think that was, uh, you know, a pretty good bill. There's a bill that you're going to get to vote on. Is now it's a, a referendum, and that is whether or not teenage girls, 16 or under, who are going to have an abortion, whether or not the abortion provider has to notify the parents of that girl before they perform that abortion. I think that's a good idea. It has safeguards in it for with the opportunities to opt out and to bypass. Um, it also prohibits coercing a young girl into having an abortion. I would have signed uh, that bill. There was a bill that would have changed the medical standards in medical liability, the goal of which was to reduce defensive medicine. Today we know that we pay as, as much as a third of our health care costs are driven by unnecessary or wasteful health care. And a big part of that is defensive medicine. We don't want to have doctors to feel that they're forced to do tests on people that they don't think are necessary just because they're frightened of being sued. That bill, I would have signed, the governor vetoed it. There are a number of other tort reform bills that I think were good, that would have been helpful to our economy and helped us grow the economy of the state of Montana. So there are a number of bills that I think were good bills that would have helped create jobs and more opportunity in Montana that would help strengthen our families, and I would have supported those bills. Mr. Bullock, one minute. I think there were also a lot of crazy bills. I mean, we're not going to create the economy of the future if we secede from the nation, or go to gold standard, or spend most of the time talking about silencers and atlas, or bills that would actually restrict the opportunities to have public access on public lands, one of the great equalizers on all of us. There were bills that would have impacted women's health care decisions. There were bills that would have, you know, by, by initiative, we made a cyanide heap leech ban saying you can't do that at the headwaters of the Blackfoot. Much like you've dealt with here on the North Fork, that was a bill passed by initiative. The governor vetoed it. We need to get to the point where we're really saying, What's going to move Montana forward? And I think that we can do that. And I think at the end of the day, Democratic legislators and Republican legislators, we all hopefully come in thinking about that, and let's try to get people together so we can get there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hill, your next question will come from Myers-Reese. Mr. Hill, you've been critical of the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Department, uh, including its wolf management. You've promised to bring significant changes to the department's agenda, commission, and leadership. The department has a large presence up here as the manager of wildlife and state parks and more. What specific changes can FWP, FWP employees and the public expect to see if you're elected governor? Uh, what's interesting is I, I've driven 84,000 miles now uh, all over the corners of Montana. And the reason that we came out with a comprehensive plan to deal with fish, wildlife, and parks is that every corner of the state I went into, people were complaining about fish, wildlife, and parks. Sportsmen were complaining because of the wolf particularity, but predator impacts on wildlife. Landowners were complaining about the lack of cooperation and working relationship with people within the agency, particularly the leadership of the agency. If you go into northeastern Montana, just recently almost all of the ranchers and farmers in the Glasgow Valley County area have withdrawn from the block management program because of the insistence on the part of this agency to want to put bison everywhere in Montana. In fact, their official policy is that they want bison running around Montana like deer and elk. That doesn't work for people in agriculture, I can tell you. And so, and I've talked with I don't know how many dozens of landowners who've pulled out of the block management program that's reducing opportunities for Montana hunters and anglers to be able to access these wildlife. And so as a result of that, we met with biologists, people within the agency and others that deal with the agency, uh, game wardens, um, sportsmen, all different groups of people, and we've developed a comprehensive plan. And I suggest you go to our website to look at it because it's comprehensive. 
But the starting point is, is that we've got to restore respect between sportsmen, the agency, and landowners. And as we rebuild those relationships, we can then expand the block management program and create more opportunities for people to have access to private land. Because some of the best habitat and most of the wildlife are on those private lands. But we won't get there until we rebuild a relationship. My director's number one job will be starting to rebuild those relationships. Mr. Bullock, two minutes. There are parts um, that I would agree with the congressman on that. This is um, an agency, and all agencies are much the same, but this is one where we need professional management. With the best interests of the habitat, the wildlife, the landowners, bringing everybody together to do that. When I got to choose a colonel of the highway patrol, I didn't say, well, what's his politics or what's, you know, where's he come from? I said, who's actually going to be the best to manage the highway patrol? And that's exactly the same way I'll take when it comes to fish, wildlife and parks. Because I think we need, you know, this is hunting and fishing opportunities are one of the reasons why so many of us are here. And it really is the great equalizer. It doesn't matter the size of your pocketbook um, for that. Now, when it comes to wolves, and I said quite a while ago, there's only probably, you know, I actually tried to do my part last hunting season. I got a wolf permit. Um, but we need to, we have something in the state right now where there's really only two ways to become a wildlife biologist. One is to go to the university. The other is to run for office. Again, we need professionals to manage that. I think I heard somewhere that you said, okay, we'll, we'll put those biologists in the governor's office. If that's the case, boy, that's gonna let them just be professional and you know, away from politics. I think we can manage and we can work with landowners. I think we can improve the block management program. Eight million acres, 1,200 involved, 440,000 hunter days. But we also always have to remember that the wildlife and the Constitution even provides it. It's public. It's held in trust for all of us. So we can't make, end up making rules where we're essentially privatizing wildlife. And whoever has the most money can get the biggest horns. That's not what Montana's about. That's Texas. Mr. Hill, one minute. Uh, just for clarity, uh, the biologist we want to put into the governor's office is to assist local governments asserting their coordination rights as they fight for, with federal agencies to have more responsible resource management. Look, uh, we came out with a real aggressive plan for wolves, including trapping, more aggressive hunting season, more licensing, allowing non-residents to hunt them because we have way too many. The, uh, the elk herd that coming out of Yellowstone Park has gone from 20,000 to 4,000. Uh, and so we have an aggressive plan. What's interesting is, is that even though the administration opposed most of those ideas when we came out with them, they're slowly actually incorporating them into the plan now. But we need to be far more aggressive in managing predators. Uh, but the most important thing we need is to start rebuilding relationships. Well, I don't support limiting people's access to private land by developing new uh, techniques. What we want to do is have a relationship between landowners, sportsmen, and the agency so that they will willingly open their land to create more opportunities for Montana hunters. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bullock, your next question will come from Myers Reese. Mr. Bullock, your opponent has proposed a plan to fund schools to the use of oil and gas revenue, uh, shifting away from property taxes as a funding source. Uh, you've criticized the proposal as a bait and switch. Uh, do you have a plan uh, with specifics that you believe is a better approach to provide adequate funding for schools or even, as you've called for, increase funding for schools. Yeah, and indeed, I don't think that there's ever been for public education probably a more dangerous time. Um, when the congressman calls our teachers second to the worst in the nation, when again he tries to find what are the worst statistics as opposed to what are the best as our eighth graders are achieving. I, the property tax that he talks about, all right, we'll cut $200 million of property taxes. We'll use $100 million of oil and gas money that's actually already been being used and goes into the general fund and actually is part of funding education. It's a shell game. And that's not how we improve our schools. When it comes to funding of the schools, and that's from the beginning, I said part of what we need to do with that surplus is invest in schools. The state needs to take more. 
We can do a number of things. I mean, we want our kids ready for 21st century economy. We gotta make sure that they have technology in their schools to have a 21st century schools. We can use some one-time only money just to address some of the technology needs. And there's actually an assessment going on right now. We also need to make sure that, you know, especially in areas like Kalispell, where your property tax base isn't as high as some other state or some other counties. And also, you know, how is it that we actually fund education that if you have a high school district of six, you get the same basic entitlement, this chunk of money, as a high school district that has 4,000 students in it. We need to address that. We also need to address the fact that if we put more money in the state side, from wherever it comes, from oil and gas, from general fund, from others, you know what, that can provide relief long term on the property tax side. But the idea shouldn't be just, here's my education plan, I'm going to cut taxes, and there's nothing coming in to fill that hole. We can do better in public education, and we ought to. Mr. Hill, two minutes. As I think everybody in this room knows, in Montana, education reply, uh, requ uh, relies almost exclusively on property taxes to fund it. And we have substantially high property taxes as a result of that. And so what our plan is, is really simple. I mean, where there's a $450 million or more surplus their uh, the revenues this year exceeded the projections by about $260 million. There's plenty of room for us to provide about $100 million worth of tax relief every year by using those oil and gas revenues, dedicating them to this purpose. You know, one of the challenges that we have is that property taxes is a relatively stagnant form of taxation. And so if schools need a more dynamic source of revenue in order to address growing populations and growing needs and inflationary increases, then it makes sense to me to tie it to a more dynamic source of income to the state. Now, Wyoming is a good example of a state that's done it. North Dakota is starting to do it too, where schools are totally funded out of coal revenues. Teachers there are paid a lot more than Montana. In fact, they, Wyoming comes here and recruits some of our best teachers. Every kid who graduates from high school with a C-plus average or better gets a scholarship to go to college. It's a sound way to fund education using natural resource revenues to do it. Certainly there are people that are afraid of change. Now with regard to the quality issue, I want to clear the air about this. It was the data quality people who identified two shortfalls in Montana, said we're dead last in what we know about our kids' educational development, and that we're second to last in what they labeled as teacher quality. And I've always gone on to say the point of this is unfair to teachers, because it really isn't an assessment of the quality of our teachers. It's an assessment of our capacity as a system to deal with quality issues with regard to teachers. We are second to last in our, be, in our ability to make adjustments in the classroom when we have quality problems in the classroom, which is why we propose reforms for that as well. Mr. Bullock, one minute. But I think that's an example of the congressman trying to find something as bad as possible and saying, here's the problem. He's also saying this is why he wants to essentially privatize public education, have charter schools in Montana, tax credits for private schools, He'll often say, you know what, 30% of the kids that come go to our colleges need remedial classes. That is a concern, but you know what? 43% of the kids that go to two-year colleges are non-traditional students, 25 years or older, 30% at the, at the MSU and U of M. I don't know if all of us could pass a trigonometry test right now. We can improve the system, and we can hold it accountable. But we do that within the public system. We don't defund it, we don't devalue it, and we don't dismantle it. And that's what I'll do. I will actually, public education is a great equalizer. It's what made it so I could stand here as Attorney General. My kids are in the same schools that actually my wife went to. I think that we can continue to improve it. Thank you. Uh, at this point, we're gonna change it up just a little bit, and we would like to give each candidate a chance to ask the other one question. Mr. Bullock, you will ask your question first, and Mr. Hill, you have two minutes to respond. There will be no rebuttals in this round of questioning. Mr. Bullock, your question. You know, we dr addressed that a little bit before, um, Congressman, but I mean, state law says aggregate contributions per election are limited as follows. And that's per election. And the election happens, I think, in 20 days or something like that. 
So how can you say in good faith when the law is clear that we limit it and that law is in force right now? As you and I are here, there is a limit on what an individual can give us an aggregate per the election and there are limits on political parties. How can you in good faith say right now when that's the text that you can take $500,000 and spend it as you might want to? Two minutes, Mr. Hill. Uh, the reason is, is a federal judge has said that that law is unconstitutional and that decision is still the pending decision in the state of Montana. Now I happen to think a federal, I'd take a federal judge's opinion about this matter before I take your opinion about this matter. Uh, that federal judge has determined that Montana's campaign contribution limits are unconstitutional because they don't create a fair playing field for Montana citizens and they don't create a fair playing field for Montana candidates. And the reason for that is, is that all you have to do is look at what you see on TV today with attack ad after attack ad after, I don't know how many, how many of you enjoy that? I sure don't enjoy it. Uh, tearing people down, and these people can raise money in unlimited quantities. Uh, the, in, in the Democratic Party, the Democratic Governors Association has created a PAC and they've moved the money from PAC to PAC to PAC to PAC to try to keep people from being able to track how that money is being spent. And they spent millions of dollars attacking me, attacking my running mate, trying to destroy our reputations, our credibility, misrepresenting, for example, that we somehow support a sales tax that we've never, ever embraced. The point of this is, is that, so these people can spend unlimited sums of money saying whatever they want, and the rest of us are limited to relatively small amounts. Montana's the smallest amount of contributions in the country. It's not a balanced playing field. And the, and the judge said, this is unconstitutional. And I think he's right. We've got to get to a system where everybody plays by the same rules and where there's complete transparency in that process. We accepted a contribution from the party. Should come no surprise. The Republican Party supports us. Uh, and we've been completely transparent about that. It hasn't been wandered through a bunch of PACs and different things. You can see that it's there. You can make a judgment about that if you think that that's an improper thing to do. I don't think it's an improper thing to do because the other side has spent $3 million attacking me unfairly. Thank you. And now, Mr. Hill, your question from Mr. Bullock. Well, Steve, um, you know, one of the big challenges up here has been high unemployment rate, uh, you know, a serious challenge, I think, to this community. And this has been ongoing. I mean, we went through a period of some temporary prosperity here as a consequence of the real estate activity that occurred. But this area of, state of Montana has lost literally thousands of jobs because of limited access to the federal land. And this is particularly true in the area of timber harvest. That's been largely a consequence of environmental groups that do support you, support you energetically. So what I want to ask you is, are there any specific things that you're going to do as governor to help these people have some assurance that we're going to get access to these federal lands again, get some of these jobs back so that we can support our families? Two minutes. Thanks for the question, Congressman. And first, just to clarify, too, that and we've both been really busy and traveling, but there are three federal judges that just said and issued an opinion yesterday that said that one federal judge is dead wrong, so the law is back in force. But I agree, and as I said earlier, that communities have been hit. And we need to do all we can to actually improve those opportunities, especially in things like, and it wasn't up in Kalispell, but in Sealy Lake area where there was actually a collaborative project. You know, some of the environmental groups came together, the timber groups came together, everybody said, let's actually do this. It's gonna be good for our forests, it's good for our mills, good things are gonna happen. There was a lawsuit that was filed that I think had 42 different claims. Judge kicked out all of them but one. Now, I don't like those lawsuits. And I think that we can do things. As I said earlier, I've actually talked to the regional forester and said, look at what we've done at the state level and look at where we've been able to actually. 215 million board feet in the last four years. 100 timber sales. Were there dissenters? 
At times, yeah, there were folks that were saying, I wish you wouldn't cut here, you wouldn't cut there. But I think we did it responsibly. And we did it with long-term aims toward the habitat. And we can continue to do that. And we can actually, and anytime, I'll fight with the federal government anytime we need to do it. And I've done it as Attorney General on a number of issues. Turned around and said, you know what? I'll always protect our Second Amendment rights. I've said Keystone XL, and I know even some of those environmental groups disagree with me on that, could provide great opportunities for the state. But also, I'll collaborate when there's possibilities. And I hope that there's possibilities to collaborate with the federal government in getting more timber sales going on federal lands. Thank you. Uh, before closing statements, I would like to again thank our co-sponsors, Flathead Valley Community College and AARP, for making it possible to bring the governor candidates to Kalispell. Uh, pulling off one of these debates can be a lot of work, and this college has hosted two high-profile debates in four days, so I think we should give them a little round of applause for that. And now on to our uh, closing statements. Mr. Hill, you have two minutes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Flathead Community College, the Beacon, the AARP, and I'm forgetting somebody, I'm afraid, but uh, for sponsoring this, I appreciate it very much. I do want to bring clarity to one thing that uh, Steve said, and that is the Federal Court of Appeals did not overturn the district court judge. He sent, they simply issued a stay on his order. Uh, that is yet to be resolved. They did indicate that they I might be inclined to do that, but there haven't even been arguments about that yet. Look, I'm running for governor because I believe that Montana can do better. I think that we can have higher per capita incomes. We can create jobs at a faster pace. If we build a climate that, inve that attracts investment, that'll cause us to grow. I cited statistics that show that we have some deficiencies in our legal and regulatory climate. It's simply true that that's there. We can, we can address those issues without surrendering our uh, obligations and responsibilities in the environment. We don't have to trade the big sky country to get the treasure state. We can have both. We can streamline the regulatory process. That's part of what priority budgeting is about, is examining how we do things, what the activities are, so that we can make sure that it's effective in getting things done and living up to our responsibilities, but also accommodating growth in our economy. I do believe that we need to do better in our schools. Almost 20% of our kids today are not graduating from high school. We should be concerned about that. We, took, we spoke to an elementary school today, 50 kids in there. Based on those statistics, if that's an average class, you know, 10 of those children won't graduate from high school. High percentage of our high school graduates do poorly on the ACT test. Uh, a lot of them have to go into remedial education when they uh, reach the university system. Surely we can do better than that. And so what I believe we have is an obligation to the next generation. And that obligation is to make sure they have an opportunity for a good job, that they have a government that works with them instead of against them, and then they have a school that's going to prepare them for the 21st century. If you elect me governor, those will be my priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bullock, two minutes. No, I too appreciate um, the sponsors. Thank all of you for coming. Thank all of you for taking an interest in this election. Well, briefly, Congressman, those three judges said actually the law that was passed by Citizens Initiative that have limits is in effect right now, and it is in effect um, through the election. I think Montana can do better. We did both go to a uh, seventh grade today, not class, not together. Like he'll want to, though, point out, you know what, we have almost 20% of our kids that aren't completing in four years. As opposed to saying, yeah, 2018, one kid's too many. It's probably, I think it's the sixth lowest dropout rate in the nation. And he'll say, oh, Wyoming, they throw so much money at their schools. And they do. They pay over $4,000 more per student. Our educational outcomes are better. So let's actually look at some of the things and the good things that are happening. We do agree on some things. Montana certainly can do better. For me, this isn't some academic exercise where I try to find a statistic to, that makes Montana look bad. My exercise is, I'll drive home tonight after this debate. They'll be asleep, I'll see them tomorrow morning. We started late. I have a fifth grader, I have a second grader, and I have a kindergartner. Montana was a gift growing up for me, provided wonderful opportunities. If I'm so fortunate to be elected governor and get a two terms, the minute I'm kicked out of the governor's office, 
my oldest, Caroline, will just be getting out of high school. So really, for me, it's personal. What kind of Montana can we create and for not only 2013, but for future generations? I'm enthusiastic about the opportunity. I think I've done a good job working on your behalf as Attorney General, and I'll do so as Governor. Thanks again so much for taking interest in this. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause for coming.